So here we go. Now my mic is on. I'm sitting here talking about how we're going to do advanced drum mixing. I didn't um, put the 48 volts on, which basically amplifies my voice like largely and the speakers. So I actually have to turn my speakers on. So one second. This is hard. One sec. I like to turn my computer off like once a week or so, but like I have to turn down everything. Turn off everything. My speakers go into auto sleep mode to prevent them from being damaged if I don't close them after long periods of time. Um, yeah, so we have that, so they're on, and my microphone is on, it's on mono, obviously. It's going to there. And then we'll just, I guess, open this a little bit. And... Why? It must make it so difficult. Okay. So let's get to that advanced drum mixing, eh? Let me just throw this in real quick and then play some notes so I can hear what I'm doing. Okay. Oops. Okay. So, advanced drum mixing. Let's let's go over that. So you want your drum samples, the anything with drum mixing in general, you need to have good samples to start off with. If your samples are bad to begin with, you're not going to go very far unless you really, really know what you're doing. But the better the sample, the less work you have to do, which is nice. You always want to have samples that don't even require you to like EQ them or anything. They just work right away. And you just have to focus on like volume control and like compression and... It'll, it'll just like flow nicely. So there's many ways you can do drum setups in Bitwig. You can use a third party drum sampler or sampler of sorts like Battery 4. Battery 4 is not specifically a drum sampler or drum storage space. It's called the sampler. Um, it has sampling cells. They're called cells, sampling units, and each little square thing's a cell. And so you, there's up to like um, 48 cells. So there's 48 sampling units inside of uh, Battery 4. Battery 4 is really good. And then you've got Bitwig's drum machine, which is literally the same thing as Battery, if you know what you're doing, right here. And um, what you can do is you can make two of these or whatever to organize. So you can use each drum machine as a group. And then if you select both of them and control G, it'll just put them in this right away. So there's a drum machine. So we got to do this, though. So now we have a drum machine and a drum machine. And then if we look in the mixer, we've got... Why is this on the master? We've now got a drum machine and we can process the individual units separately by clicking this arrow. If we actually added like a sampler of sorts, like say we added like FM4 here and then FM4. What is happening? So I can click down. I've got two FM4s. If I moved one to the other one, now I've got it in both like in, it's not working, but, um, on a very basic level, this is exactly like battery is, and then it's just a matter of like your samples and processing, like if it's going to work out um, or not. And then another way to do it, this is the way I like to do it, is just go ahead and like find samples or whatever. I'll just pick that one and like. 
Wait, was that a snare? Oh, okay. And it's got a kick hybrid. We'll just use one and one. Here we are. So we got, and then. So you hear how that sounded really weird? Here's a very important thing when drum sampling um, in Bitwig, especially like on these kinds of samples, you want to select them. And you want to do two things to your samples, to any sample, uh, mainly kick stuff. If you're just going to use something like a, like a riser or something, for example, um, it's going to be time stamped. And because it's a synthesizer with like pitch and the way this, these, are designed. Hang on. Actually, hang on. No, stop doing that. I hate how it does that. Like, if you notice, like, it's got like perfect timing already, right? Like this. Uh, will it come out to four bars? Eight or the 16 it's saying? Yeah, it does. So you gotta be careful with these kinds of things when doing samples. That it's not like butchering them with, with like stretching. This is, this came out at 110 like it should have. This one didn't. Um, this came out at 110 like it should have which is really good. Um, so those are coming out properly, right? But when you, for example, import like a kick or snare, they're not gonna always come out to whatever tempo you want. So you have to either set them to your song tempo, or you need to just make sure the stretch is on raw. Uh, you do not want things like kicks or snares being stretched. So now you can hear that our snare is actually just fine or kick or snare that won't play that's lame let's try that again that uh that's doing just fine yeah why to start recording i don't understand yeah okay it's fine so that's one thing to be careful of. And also, I really enjoy cleaning up my kicks. So, for example, I'm going to... I like to keep this to, like, just, like, a very specific... I don't want it to be, like, out here like that. And it wasn't even. It was, like, stretched like that. I want it to be very specific in case I wanted to do this. So, in the process of doing that, um, you'll notice if you have a sample and you end it, like, kind of early. Earlier you end it. You get these clicks. You want to make sure in kicks and snares and um, those kinds of samples, you want to make sure that your sample is actually faded out like that. So now if I end it, it, it removes the click because it's fading the volume out as soon as this, this metadata, metadata clip ends. So it's going to fade out the volume because it knows, oh, the clip ends here. Um, about here, I should start to end the clip and take the volume out. Um, this prevents it from clicking, which is good, but you notice, like, if you have the in one on, it gets rid of that click as well, which you don't necessarily want for percussion, so to keep that in mind. That's good for if you're trying to mix vocals together, if you have in-out fades and you're mixing vocals together, you can get rid of, like, any abrupt changes or kind of help with the abrupt changes so those are two important points i wanted to make with like the with uh this um now moving onwards when mixing these you want to also have them going to like the same group relatively like this so what i'm gonna do is just make like a Let's make just like a two bar loop here that's gonna stop come on here it's gonna be like 
we'll liven it up with some stuff after. You want to make sure the sounds, first of all, are balanced when it comes to your your uh, thing. So we'll name this like punch. So you want to make sure there's a there's a peak, and the peak's not being changed. So you want to make so one way to do this is to watch the peak here. So right now I can tell you the kick's the loudest. So then what I'm gonna do is find that spot where the snare will start to actually um, take like mess with this in here. So I can see this is actually a negative 12 as a result of what I had turned it down. So if I actually default this, just a little bit. And now it's at this, but if you look, they're pretty close, right? But um, the way snares build is actually, so the reason why the kick's at 10.4 is because of its initial transient and then the snare's transient is much larger. It's like this whole section right here, like all that fatness and the kick's transient, as you can see, is very small at the start and then the snares is very consistently large because that's just how the snare comes out. So that's why the snare might sound louder. So you might want to whatever works by ear, right? So now I've got these together. Um, one thing you could do to kind of keep this clean is just like for no real reason, just EQ out the low end. Most professionally made snares like the ones I have are already handle that kind of issue. See, there's like all that stuff there. You can barely hear it, right? So like... What we'll do is we'll actually low pass it in Fab Filter. Fab Filter is amazing. Best thing in the world. So we'll put this up to 110. And then we'll listen to what it's cutting out. It's getting rid of like that bassy stuff you don't need. But does it affect the overall snare? Nope. So it doesn't matter. Um, so we got rid of that. Um, kicks, relatively, you want all the frequencies inside of them. You don't, and so, like, literally what I did was just a quick cleanup on that. You could, if you want, actually cut out some of that 35 range. Because it gets rid of a little bit of stuff, and, like, your kick's not really going to hit that 35 range. That's part of your sub's purpose. Not that anything is going to hit that anyways. My speakers I have are between like um, 35 hertz to 25 kilohertz. So they don't really pick up that stuff. They do have some great sub abilities, but they don't pick up all that really, really like crazy 20 hertz stuff. That's kind of unnecessary. Um, many producers like on Monster Cat and stuff don't actually mix with the subwoofer. And that's good because um, you don't need to know it's there. It's just really loud. That's the stuff that's going to be in the club that everyone's going to know when it gets there. And um, hearing that 20 hertz reason region isn't important if you're using a separated sub because the sub's always going to sound the same. As long as you know how loud the sub is from the 35 hertz region and up, um, the 20 hertz will always be the same and like consistent. So it's not a big deal. So, yeah. So I removed a bit of mud out of these two. That's all I really did because overall the sound's pretty nice. You can give kicks a more like f solid flat feel by taking away some of the mid stuff around 200. If you compress it, you can compress it. Just taking away that. You give it a flatter feel if you want into that so what's important about these two is that they get like somewhat compressed together i guess so i'm gonna use fab filter as a compressor pro mb here like by doing this if you have if you have fab filter this will apply to you but 
this is like the threshold the compression level or whatever and then change the output and the attack so so i don't want to compress it too much obviously I'm just gonna do that to it so now it's done now there's multiple ways you can mix the hi-hats into this that's that's some pretty solid drum stuff we got going on right here so now our only worries is oops how do we mix everything drum like the percussion -y stuff or whatever so we'll take that search key out and go back into leviathan where I get all my hi-hat samples and such. We'll just use one hi-hat as the example for today. Hi-hats, I like to take them out here and then bounce them in place. So they're, they're, they just have this line really that finishes them off. I don't know, it just makes me personally happy. like hang that one or something like just like actually no hang on well we will use another one And then I'm going to bring this one in, put some out on it. These are all at 110. I have smart samples that came like kind of like this. So I'm actually just going to do this. Drag this over here, end it early to get rid of any extra sound, any noise, because it's a loop. And then I'm just going to like do. I personally like to mix these, the percussion-y stuff like this, separately. And what I have been doing for a long time was... Oh, come on. Was I would like to sidechain them uh, as well by whatever it was going on so like if i were to go side chain these now what oh yeah it's called dynamics no plugins called side chain so then like uh you'd have a trigger and such Um, you could actually just mix them in with this too and they'll take part of the compression that goes on here. That's fine too. There's multiple ways to do it. So how I've been doing it recently is I'll keep it in the same group. I will, maybe I'll actually group them separately from everything, but they're still going to the same place. And then I will like EQ. You don't want to waste your time EQing every single instrument unless it's like, you want it to sound like a very specific way. So I'll just come over here and get rid of all this crap over here. Maybe we'll go 350. Bring down some stuff here and then raise a bit of high. Because that's what I want, right?
like that. And then what I'm going to do is add a little bit of verb. If you add verb, it almost makes it sound like it's real, kind of realish. So that's like kind of important as you make it sound like as real as possible kind of because you don't want to just be like robotic you want to have robotic hi-hats really in most cases in fact you could even put this on the like the whole master thing just like um yeah actually that's another thing i want to talk about reverb is important to have on everything so the way I'm going to do this, though, is I'm going to make an effect track, put it in this group, name it verb. Effect tracks are very useful for this, for, like, everything, actually. I'm going to put it on here. I'm going to send punch, the punch group. Can I not do it like that? Okay, I'm going to send everything in the punch group. So, like this and this. Can I not? That's lame. Okay, here's, a, here's how I'm actually going to do it. Uh, you know what? I'm just going to put this over here, actually, because this doesn't need to take part. So this is going to be drum verb. And what I'm going to do is put a fab filter pro cue on it. I'm going to take out all the 350 stuff like that. That's going to go into here where I will just take down all that low stuff, set the low level to around 350, and then I'm going to have my room or whatever, my d delay time. I'm going to take punch, send 100% of it to the drum verb. So let's see what's happening. So now what I'm going to do in drum verb is mess around with this volume knob, because messing around with this volume knob is going to determine the amount of reverb, and I only want 100% reverb. So you can kind of hear, but you see how that like kind of more under the impression that someone's actually drumming this rather than just, you can tell this is in the box, but if you have stuff like this, it sounds a little more passable. You know what I mean? Like it sounds like it's actually being recorded out of a room, which I find is really sweet. Um, using this reverb tactic here, you could use higher quality verbs if you want but then this verbs just you could you have the option to send this back oh no you don't um this will just go to the master and i've already removed any kind of like potential side or mid right here so it doesn't actually matter um this isn't going to create any kind of bass or stereo problem so this actually isn't creating mud like you might think this isn't actually doing this isn't going to create any further mixing problems it's just so little tail like it doesn't even matter so um so now we got this like this what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna make another <laughs> effect track called like drum transient i was gonna call it just trans but i'm not gonna do that now so now we have these two things and then what we're gonna do is once again send this 100 percent to drum transient this is very much EDM mixing or like just punchy missing mixing. And on here, we're going to have a fab filter MB, which is just going to be, Oh, that was a mistake. What'd I do? All right, cool. So I take this, delete those, stretch this over here, get this sort of thing. I'm, this is going to have like a, a hard attack really fast release hard ratio hard thresh 
because of what I want this to do. hard to explain. I basically want to bring out the transient more. Let's just try using this. Let's see what kind of throat, like, problems we can get. See how these transients are being like really widened out? That's more or less what I was aiming for. Seems like this actually isn't. It's not exactly doing what I wanted to, unfortunately. So yeah, we're really getting those transients out here. second okay so yeah we got me dragging out the transients So now it's extra punch. So we basically went from this to this. The whole game has been stepped up now um, for the drum mixing. Sorry, this is long. This is actually like super important stuff here. So this trigger is not useless, useful anymore. It's not doing anything. That's how I do my drum mixing personally. Um, I'm not actually, I'm going to leave this in here. Um, so this is like basically the drum kit right now. If you want to add things like rides, things that aren't short, um, you're going to want to side chain stuff. So let's get into that. Say I want to add a crash. All right. If I were to put this crash in here, so it's got it's got the stuff being cut out of the, the out of the low end, so you can fit it on top of the kick easy. So you can do these together if you want. Got to be careful with these Leviathan crashes. So. What I will sometimes do is actually I will sidechain these ones. Things like crashes that are long. I uh, I actually do sidechain them. And I'm not sidechaining it. to stop it from sounding so sudden. But I'm also, once again, going to 
cut that low stuff. And I'm going to send this this to the drum verb as well. Like this. Well, we could actually group all of these together in one big...